Uh, my name's Chris Ramey. I'm the university's architect and associate vice president for campus planning and real estate. I was uh, born, raised, educated in Eugene. I'm a graduate of the university. I graduated in architecture. Practiced in New York City for five years and in Portland for a year before I came back. I've been here about 20 years, but I have not been here as long as my colleague. Who? Fred Tepfer, who also grew up in Eugene, went to the University of Oregon, knew Chris's family from elementary school on. So I guess it's just an odd coincidence, but here odd. we are. Uh, so. I'm also an architect. And uh, because of our work, we've had to get to know the history of the campus pretty well. And here we are to do and it. Here we are. Yeah. So what we're going to do today is we're going to walk you through the history of the campus. We have about five stops on our tour. Um, and we've arranged it around four broad categories. And most of these categories were true at any campus across the country. Where, and, and they are, in, in summary, they're a building on a hill, uh, buildings around quadrangles, buildings as objects, and then the last phase, neo-traditional or neo-traditional campuses. Um, we think this is going to take about an hour and change. We're, we want to be, we want you to be engaged, so if you have questions and you want to interrupt us, that's perfect. I think the, the, uh, the camera crew would like it if we did as much talking as we can, kind of at where the numbers are, so they're not running around with the camera, and that's, that's fine with me. But if you want to ask us questions as we go, that's good too. Questions did, about anything. Did, and did you want to add anything I, else? I think that sounds great. I know we're going to do some indoor visits to classrooms, or we're going to stick outside? I think we're going to stay outside. outside. Okay, yeah. Just because the logistics are going in and out to the classroom, okay. so yeah. Wonderful. So as I said, we have the four categories, and then in each category we have themes. One of the themes is what the buildings look like, and there's a little picture of each of the buildings. One of the themes is what the, what the campus landscape was like in terms of its trees. One of them is uh, classrooms, which is, this one became a series of cartoons about classrooms. I mean, we'll try to talk a little bit about that on each one. And then sports, what was happening with sporting facilities on the campus. And then the final category is who was actually on the campus at that time? How many men, were they from Oregon? Are they from out of state? And so, and then at the end we also have, Who's here today? Well, actually, I think this is last fall, but it's close enough for today. So we are at um, the University of Oregon in 1876. Deeney Hall was the first building. Brand new. Brand new. It's a brick building. Um, it's painted gray because the second building on campus, Ballard Hall, was meant to imitate stone and does imitate stone. You can see the rustications. It looks like big stonework, like it's carved stone. It's actually brick too. But they went, they painted this building gray to match that building. And, and so, also because the brick was falling apart because it was made here in Eugene, you can go to the Masonic Cemetery, there's a huge hole in the ground, which is where the clay came from <laughs> to make this building. So that, that was pretty much the idea about building technologies. You want to use stuff that you can get locally. And if you've studied uh, sustainability or ideas about that, you know that that's a big piece of sustainability, is always trying to build with materials that are here because you cut down on the distance that uh, those materials have to travel. For example, if you're using Italian marble, that's got to travel a lot before it gets into your building. So imagine the transportation cost of that. Um, the building is built on top of the hill. If you turn around and look down the sidewalk, the sidewalk is the extension of 12th Street. That's 12th Street behind you. And at that time, 12th Street went downtown. So if you came to the campus and you were a member of the town, you walked down 12th Street, up this sidewalk, and literally into the building. This is our connection between town and gown. And town was a long ways away. There wasn't town right there. It was what are now blocks and blocks and blocks of fields and farms. And then this was on the hill outside of town, looking back toward town, but removed. So if you came as a student, one of the things you were asked to do was to bring firewood. 
<laughs> so when you came in, you took the firewood into the basement and they put it in the boiler and they heat the building. The building actually served as a dormitory for a while. It was dormitories, it was classrooms. It's now pr primarily used by the math department. The math department's actually housed in Benton Hall, but a lot of math classes happen here. Uh, it's been subdivided, it's had an elevator put in it. Uh, one of the projects, they tore the building apart and they found sawdust between the floors to serve as a sound insulation between each of the floors. Uh, the building also, when you came, you would not see any trees. The only trees that would have been here then are, there's only one left, we're not going to get to see it today, but it's on the other side of the lard, and it's the Condon Oak. There were three oak trees on the campus on the other side of the lard hall. Well, one of the reasons this became the university is that you couldn't really farm it. It wasn't very good soil, it was pretty thin, and nothing grew on it <laughs> except for those three oak trees. And grass. So every tree you see around you has been planted in the time since. And they, in fact, it was so hard for, to get trees to grow that the groundskeepers, well, I think they were probably more like custodians Just then. Janitors, yeah. They were paid a dollar if they could keep a tree alive for a year. And this is a so dollar as back a bonus to them. then, which is worth $10 well, now. Probably, it's probably pretty significant yeah. now. So the, the, these are dug firs, again, uh, native trees <coughs> planted on either side of this walkway as we go up and down the walkway. You'll notice there's a little plaque. There's one right here. It says University Day 1907. So the, the sidewalk was improved in increments. I think it goes up to 1914, 1916 maybe, as part of something called University Day, which we still have in the spring. So you'll all be uh, invited to join in that. There's probably no concrete pouring, uh, but there might be tree planting and other events that happen as part of University Day. When the students arrived in, in 1876 and the years after that, in the early days they had two main requests. One was for fences to keep the cattle out and the pigs, <laughs> which were just running wild. And the other was for boardwalks, for sidewalks, because it was so muddy. It was so muddy. So just draw your attention to these little pictures that are here. <clears throat> Those are the little trees that they were getting a dollar a year. And there was no, of course, there was no Villard Theater then. So you're standing kind of where the bookstore is. You're looking up the hill with no trees except those little trees. And then at the bottom in sports, the first athletic field was down at the bottom there, where kind of where the computing center is. And that looks like it was probably a football game. So we'll tell you a little bit more about some of the other sporting facilities as we go through the tour. So should we go to our next? Sure. Are there any questions about our first stop? Yeah. Um, I've always oh, wondered about the, just the proportions in this building. They're so strange and odd. And I know it's been renovated several times. How, do you know how many floors there were originally? Because it's been made, you know, I know it's been renovated. Any idea? One, two, <laughs> three. Well, there's, there's, right. there's, this is the oh, plus the basement. ground floor, right. the second floor, and the basement, and then there's a tower room on each end. Mm -hmm. And what the renovations consisted of adding little mezzanine levels in uh -huh. parts because the ceilings were so They're high. so tall. But they were really two stories tall. But they didn't do it all the way through. They just did it through the corridors and some of the extra spaces. And a little bit about teaching then. It was a shoebox-shaped room. So the teacher was at the front. And the rooms are still like that in there. And then the rows are, they're, they're narrow, and then the rows go back, front to back. So very much teachers standing in the front, lecturing, and if you're in the back row, it's easy to go to sleep. So not a lot of engagement because of the way the rooms are laid out. And we'll talk a little bit about how that changed over time as well. But that was the mode that they used in this era. And, and yes, it's an unusual style now, but it was very hollow mode back then. So. And some of it was how far wood will span before you need to resupport it. And how far you can stack a brick before you need to resupport it. So some of it comes from the materials. The style of the moment was to make buildings look very vertical, make them look a lot taller than they are. So let's move on to our next stop. Is the well, Dad's other Gates? Other oh, sorry. Other other questions. Other hand. What did, Chris, I was ask, did, did yes. this building have fireplaces in it when it was built or not? Oh yeah. It did have fireplaces oh, yeah. in the classroom spaces. I, got I don't or, think so. Okay. But it definitely had wood heat. Okay. 
Yes. I'd heard that there, there are two entrances, entrances, entrances now, that one was for men and one was for women originally. So you saw that YouTube video also. Yes. So <laughs> if you haven't take, taken the opportunity to see, what's it called, the unauthorized history? Unofficial. Unofficial, and there's some pretty interesting stuff in that. I, I went through that myself. Um, so the, what, the, the story you're talking about is one was for men and one was for women because they didn't want the men to look up the women's dresses as they went up the stairs? Is that what it was? That's fine, but they didn't yeah. want their ankles to show. Their well. ankles to show. Okay, well that's kind of the same thing. So that could very well be true. <laughs> Sounds plausible. So let's go that kind of that direction down to the Green Gates. We'll walk in front of the new theater. So this is a uh, University Theater Complex. I think it was renamed the Miller Theater. Where is this sign? Miller Theater Complex. Miller, oh, it's right over there. Miller Theater, there are two theaters inside. The Robinson Theaters are traditional rows of seats and a proscenium arch. <clears throat> and there's a black box theater, which can be theater in the round or theater on two sides or one side, which is over there. So the list of line, and there's a the Pocket Playhouse, the pocket playhouse. which is student production. Uh, behind you is McKenzie Hall. McKenzie Hall was built as the law school. The law school's been in at least three places, maybe four, on campus. This was their second or third home before they moved to their current home over by the track. Um, it's now the home of the history department. There are lots of classes, good classrooms in the building. Uh, classics or comparative literature is the other Comparative literature department. and ethnic studies. And it, it comes from the buildings as objects era of campus, modern architecture where buildings were seen as objects in the landscape or pieces of sculpture. If you've been in town, you've maybe seen the, um, the new federal courthouse, the shiny metal building that, that you saw maybe close to downtown. That is a beautiful sculpture, but a very good uh, expression of this kind of architecture. You, know? you notice with E.D. Hall, it has a door, a main entrance on each side. And when they built Millard, it was done also with a door facing the town, the door facing away from the town. The next building, they kind of jumped across an open space and started building just a wall of buildings on the far side of it to make an outdoor room edged by buildings. That's, that's what we're talking about when we say a quadrant. Not necessarily a courtyard, big outdoor space, the walls of which are the fronts of the building. And when Lawrence got here, there was this informal quadrangle there, but he had other ideas. So Ellis Lawrence's grand vision was to have a gateway to campus here, which connected back down to downtown. Across the street was the railroad. The railroad used to run where, where uh, Franklin Boulevard runs now. It was moved over to the river, close to the river in 1950. But it used to be much closer. So there'd be a railroad station here. And then the best idea he had was that you could also come by water. There'd be a way that the river could actually come up here. You could come by boat, by train, or by horseback. You could walk, you come down from campus. Everybody came here. And they came through these gates and then they moved on this great axis up. And we'll go through, we'll walk along that axis in a moment up to what was going to be the auditorium but was eventually built out to the library. These gates were just repainted this summer. They hadn't been painted in probably 40 years. When they break down to find out what color they were originally painted, we found out they were originally painted the color that we use now. So <laughs> who'd have thought that? So we were lucky, or I guess we were smart, one of the two. But the color they're painted is very close to our, our standard view of our color. In the lobby of Lawrence Hall, School of Architecture and Allied Arts, there's a big model which Ellis Lawrence's firm made when he was first hired to do a master plan for the university. If, you're, if you have a minute and you're nearby, going in the south entrance of Lawrence, look a little bit to your right, and here in a plexiglass case is this really cool model showing what, in 1914, he thought the university should grow into. And uh, different buildings are different colors depending on whether they were already there or whether he was proposing new building. 
So in the 1950s, the university built a building, Commonwealth building, that connected two of Warrington's buildings, like Gilbert Hall and Commonwealth. And it effectively blocked this access. So you could no longer see through here. And at the, I think at the protest of the architecture school, they cut a little hole in the bottom of it. And so one of the historians who studied Ellis Lawrence's work said that the act of putting that building there reduced Ellis Lawrence's grand vision into a peep show. So we are at the, the view that Ellis Lawrence had in mind when he created the grand plan. The buildings behind you are the, the sort of gateway buildings. Uh, they say School of Commerce and College of Education. And those were the first two to be built as part of this big idea. And they were followed shortly by the building on the left, which is uh, Chapman Hall that had the bookstore in the bottom of it. You kind of see where that door is in those display cases. That was part of the bookstore. Condon Hall on the right uh, is now home of geography and anthropology. Chapman's the home of the Honors College. <clears throat> and on the, on the right is another building as object, PLC. It's the one that I think our cartoon is based on. And at the far end is the library, which was originally going to be the auditorium, but the money for the library came first, so we did the library first. And then to the left is the art museum, which is one of Alice Lawrence's finest buildings and perhaps one of the most famous buildings he's, he's done on campus. Famous for how it manipulated the brickwork on the outside of the building in a fine tapestry that looks like a rug or a carpet. So you want to look, if you haven't been inside the museum, it's really terrific. You'll want to go in there soon. He was also dealing with a donor who insisted there'd be no windows. Doing a, an interesting looking building without windows is a little bit of a challenge for an architect. About that same time, there were trolley cars that ran down the street. When we did some work on, on that, end of the street recently to create the heart of campus. One of the things they had to dig up were these giant rails. They didn't realize they were the rails for the streetcars were still there. So they had to be dragged out. And I, I didn't get a piece. But we have some pieces over in the facility somewhere. Um, a, a little known fact, this could be an extra study bonus question. 1% of the student body comes to school on some kind of board. <laughs> either a skateboard or a longboard or a scooter. One percent. So that's a lot of boards. I don't know where they all go after they get here. That must be why the other percentage, transportation statistics, how many people walk, how many people ride their bikes, our percentage for other is higher than any other campus I've ever seen. Must be all the boards. That's part of the other right yeah. there. It's carpooling. Um, the quadrangle itself is a memorial. The sidewalks are a World War I memorial, and the trees are a World War II memorial, or something like that, or the reverse. Um, you might find plaques out in, out in the side there. Um, those are upright black English oaks. They're very tall trees. There are eight of them, and when they were planted, this is the story, I can never remember where they are. There were two extras in case two died, so there are two more black English oaks somewhere on campus. I can't remember where they are exactly. Maybe but those they, died. They, maybe they did. <laughs> but they bought extra ones in case these died because they were memorials and they, want, they didn't want to have an empty spot. They didn't want to have a tree that died and, and wasn't going to make it. As I mentioned, this was all redone as the business school. Yellow Buckeye. Um, oh, yes. So, the yellow, so who knows um, what state has the Buckeye as its Ohio. Ohio. Ohio has a Buckeye, and the Ducks played Ohio in the Rose Bowl in 1920 something. And well, there was a, and some kind of bet in 2010, thank you. There was some kind of bet about that, and so we got an Ohio Buckeye as a result. And I, I think yep. that's the Ohio Buckeye, that's the yellow Buckeye that we got <laughs> in exchange. That's right. So there you have it. Um, <laughs> other things about about the Lilith, the Lilith building is a silver a, a ward, silver level of the LEED program, um, Energy and Excellence in Design program. It's a program that recognizes energy efficient building or all, sustainable, sustainable buildings, sustainable design. The little blue things are actually photovoltaic cells. And there's a whole array of photovoltaic cells on the top of the building as well. Parts of the building are naturally heated and cooled, so there's no mechanical heating or cooling in them. Um, 
And the classrooms are, are done that way too. So classrooms from the modern era, so we'll just cover classrooms right now. You turn the shoe box, instead of the teacher being at the top of the shoe box and looking down this way, the teacher is now on the long side so that it's much easier to see the students sitting around and it's much easier for the students to see each other. So a lot of classrooms in Lillis are based on that proportion so that when you're in them you can see each other, you can talk to each other, it's much easier to see the teacher in, the, in that situation. The average distance from the teacher to the students is shorter, among the students is shorter, and it's really hard to fall asleep in the back row because you're real, real visible. Yeah, you're real close. Hardly is a back row. <clears throat> so the, the last thing before we move on, Fred mentioned there were a series of playing fields. We are actually in the end zone of that field that was in, that's in the one photograph. We don't have a photograph of the field that was right here. Just on the other side of 13th, it had a dirt track. I think one of the Hayward stands was built here and moved from oh, here really? to there. Didn't know that. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's true. The track was going to be the site of a world record in the 200 meters, or two, probably 220 yards then. And they were uh, measuring the guy who had set the record had run in, you know, meet the week before. And they said, okay, we're going to have another meet this weekend and we're going to get the real stopwatches and we're going to have a world record set. Well, part of setting a world record is being sure that the track is flat all the way around. So they went to check to see and the eastern end of the track was higher than the western end, so much higher that they weren't able to qualify for a world record. So they weren't able to set the world record there. But if you go to Hayward Field, you can see a track where there are world records have been set and world bests are set all the time. So questions about this part of the campus or, yeah? I do have a question about the lettering. Uh-huh. Uh, they're being like Roman lettering. You ever been to Rome or seen Roman lettering? I've never understood why, but it sure is a lot easier to carve stone in straight line than in curves. So maybe that has something to do with it. Well, they did yeah, well. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple years ago, they put a, a sculpture in the middle of the quad, and then it went away. Would you explain what happened there? And... You talk about the very tall, skinny thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that was actually a temporary installation of an obelisk, a long, tall spire, because there was a movement afoot to install one that would act as a giant sundial. It was installed there temporarily to try out the idea. And what's, what's the best way to say it? As a sundial, it was successful. As a piece of architecture, it wasn't quite so popular. No. <laughs> So we may someday get the sundial back, but it probably won't be there. Chris mentioned uh, Hayward Field, um, and while we're on the subject of tracks, Hayward Field's also pretty unusual because back when we were kids, it was also the football field. You, you must have gone to football games yeah. there. I certainly did. Um, and then they built Autzen Stadium. When it was no longer a football field, it, the shape of the track didn't need to be a long oval, and you can actually get some faster speeds by changing the shape of the track and widening it. The problem was the grandstands were in the way. So they jacked up the old East Grandstand, put it on rails, and moved it. <laughs> so go take a look at the East Grandstand, how big that is. Imagine moving that, what, 50 feet or so? It's about 50 feet. That was, that was an interesting moment in university history. It was. Something to thrill cocktail parties of the future with that little fact. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to walk um, up here to the library. Any other questions about this? Let's just move up sort of where, well, right where the fountain is. So I guess just straight ahead. Um, these, again, were Alice Lawrence buildings. Uh, uh, WPA projects paid for artists to be involved with the buildings. The faces on top of the library are famous people from nature, the arts, religion, history, and philosophy. There used to be a guide in at the reference desk. If you went inside, they would give you one. And they are interesting pairings of, you know, Buddha next to um, 
Darwin, or you know, there's interesting combinations of how they're done and put up there. And if you get bored, you could come out here in the daytime and look at the different faces, because it's pretty interesting. Also worked into the design are little squirrels and little, are the nuts in that one or in this? This one. I think they're in that one. Look, there's faces here. Oh, see, there's squirrels at the top. There's squirrels like hugging a nut. That's what it is. And then inside, there's a courtyard inside with water around it, and there's some kind of squirrel nut motifs in there, too. I oh, think. definitely worth going into the art museum if, for no, no other reason than to see the very beautiful courtyard. Mm -hmm. But there's also currently a comic book show that just opened. Highly recommended. So Lawrence would... Uh, probably not have liked this building. <laughs> um, in fact, there are very few people that like this building. <laughs> it, um, it came from that era of buildings as objects, uh, and, it, and it really didn't complete the, the space in the way we probably would like to have had it completed. Um, it's the home of the English department, and probably a dozen other departments that Political I'm not thinking of. Political science, sociology, econ. Oh, I, no, I can't get stopped. The humanities is here, classics, and a question. When I'm in there, it makes me dizzy. Why? <laughs> Where are you in there? It's a high up the, or? Higher up, but on yeah. any of the floors, is it like off a little in its structure? No. Well, it's settled in a few funny ways a couple times. In <laughs> the, yeah, I guess, 1970 or 71, there were, Somebody set up a bomb in the basement <laughs> toilets. And there's been a rumor ever since that the building is collapsing, which is not <laughs> true. <laughs> By the way, I think it's just the optical illusion of looking down a really long corridor. Okay. It's pretty narrow. It's, I call it the Holiday Inn effect. <laughs> That's a really big Holiday Inn up there. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that you don't see that much on our campus. We try to make it so that when you go down the hall, you're not seeing for miles. It's, it's disorienting. It's just, you see vertigo. Like so somebody asked me what the, on the upper corner there, those oh, sort of it's Spider -Man. brick red things, <laughs> those are actually cell phone antennas. And we rent uh, those to different, I think two different companies use them on this building. And then we were talking about over at the, at Hayward Field, there is a pole that's 100 feet high, looks like a light pole, but it's actually a cell phone antenna. And it's, the antennas are inside the pole. so. There are ways to design cell phone antennas so, they d so they're disguised. And if you just take the time, I guess it's a little lesson on taking the time to design things so they look good and not just putting up whatever's easiest or works most efficiently. By any chance, do you know um, which companies are using the cell phone? Because I think probably Is your cell I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> is your coverage like mine? Yeah. I, I don't. Um, I'll bet telecommunications could tell you which <laughs> ones they are. But. Do, those hall, do those rooms used to be dormitories? Nope. No. no. Built to be faculty offices. Oh. They're 99 square feet each, yep. which is really not enough. <laughs> uh, it's really not enough if you're trying to have a conversation with more than one other person. When, and again, teaching has changed in the way people teach and how much interaction there is. The need for computers, of course, heats the space up. So all those little air conditioners are up there. Those are not cool buildings. And, and the reason that most of the campus, the majority of the campus is not air conditioned. And that's because the buildings were built uh, to be occupied from this time of the year forward and not in the summer when it's hot. Because higher education only happens from uh, you know October in Oregon, anyway, October to, to mid-June. And so why would you need air conditioning? So again, change, times have changed. Now we're here all year long. We have summer session. We have faculty doing research all year long. And so we're trying to catch up. We're trying to put air conditioning in buildings. We're adding on to buildings like the library where we're adding air conditioning. The art museum we've added on to and added air conditioning. So incrementally as we go through the campus, we're, we're upgrading each of those, uh, each of those um, facilities. Also 180 PLC is an example of a large lecture hall from that era of classrooms where the teacher's at the bottom of the pit and everybody's up above in theater style. We really only have two really big ones. We have 180 PLC and 150 Columbia, Columbia not geology, Columbia. Otherwise, we, our classrooms are, are, oh, there's one in Lillis too. There's yeah, a big one in Lillis, but they're stepped down. But they're stepped down. These are the eight, the eight English oaks that Chris mentioned before 
Planted in 1940. That wasn't that long ago, which is a great example of how fast trees grow in Oregon. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's well, it's way down here. Let's go look. It's, de it's way down here. Yeah, you can't see it from back there. That's why. Right the panel's upside down. One, two, three, four. The fourth one up. No, fifth one up. So it's in this line. One, two, oh, three, four. Oh, I get it. Wow. It's upside down. Okay. <laughs> right here. And it's in this it's in this line. It's the fifth one up. Whoa. Whoa. It's okay. Whoa. Now there's a conversation piece for you. <laughs> How could you do all this and then have one of them upside down? Yeah. Or you just come over here with a friend and say, what's wrong with this <laughs> They would stare at it. They'd be here for a while. Chris, there was also another question about oh. why, why only the front facade with the, the brickwork and not the, the rest, the other four sides of the building. Well, there are, there are two reasons for that. So the question was, how come just the front part got done and not the sides or the back? There wasn't. There was an idea that this was just the first of three or four phases, so they didn't want to spend a lot of money on that. And the other, the other part of it was, it really was a lot of money <laughs> to do the patterning. And Alice wanted to emphasize the front of the building. When we added on to this building, the, um, the director of the art museum, the curator, the staff that worked inside said that the building itself is part of the collection in their mind. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we did to the building could not make it work, couldn't, couldn't affect it at all. It had to remain the same. So we had to almost double or triple the size of the building without affecting the way the building looks from this side. So that's why you, you can't, Alice Lawrence couldn't tell you that something was added on the back here because you can't see it. And when you go around the sides, it's done in a very um, understated, very subtle way to add on to the building in a very respectful way, which makes it a, a modern museum. She told me the right story, she just hold on. About? The back of the art museum. Oh, Frank Lloyd Wright. What? We could wait. When, how, when should we wait? Till they come next year? Yes. <laughs> oh. So Frank Lloyd Wright. Who, everyone knows Frank Lloyd Wright, correct? Guggenheim Museum, you know, that kind of stuff. So Frank Lloyd Wright came to Oregon probably to lecture for some reason. This is one of two architecture schools that he would have anything to do with. <laughs> and he wanted... We were very offbeat and unusual. He wanted to see this building because it had two things he was interested in. It had a uh, skylight in the throne room in this building up above here, which is fake. It's lit by electronic lights. <laughs> so that, well, that's kind of cool. I want to see that. This is modern architecture. It's a skylight lit by electronic lights. And that was very cool in 1930, no, 45, maybe. The other thing it had was mechanical air conditioning. It had a big fan that pulled air from outside here through the building. That was it. That was the mechanical air conditioning. These are two things that Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to see. While he was here, he came into the building from the back, and he looked at the back of the building, and it he used said, to used to look different, and he said, I don't, you, go ahead, I, I, I would misquote the apocryphal. Oh, I don't, I was hoping you knew exactly what he said. <laughs> he said, this is the finest building I've seen since I've been in Oregon. And it was a sort of a modernistic composition of different colored bricks and different shapes. And one of the criticisms we got when we added onto the building was we'd covered all that up. But I think we got the better end of the deal. Frank might be disappointed, but Ellis would be very happy. <laughs> yes? I'm like on the door, there's like butterflies along the top and then squirrels in the middle. What are the other two things? Uh, a, a quail or a turkey, maybe? That's like a turkey. <laughs> and a turtle? Or turtle? Squirrel? <laughs> Some kind of bird? Yeah, turkey. Could be a turkey <laughs> and a butterfly. Or, or a peacock, maybe. Why? Why? Uh, well, we don't, we don't know exactly. Where are, where are the ducks? Oh, there, why aren't there ducks? Well, the duck, no ducks. the duck wasn't the mascot at that time. That would be my first answer. What was the mascot? We were the webfoots. We were the webfoots, which referred to men that had wet feet, apparently. And that somehow translated into ducks, which... It was a, headline writers. Headline writers, right. For it was sure. a sports paper, for sure. Yeah. And I don't know why he picked those exact animals. Um, it might have been a combination of him working with artists 
and what they were interested in, but obviously they were interested in nature, they were interested in what was here. I, I think we should change to the University of Oregon squirrels, because I see squirrels everywhere. Well, the, <laughs> the fighting turtles, but that's already been taken. So was there another question? I was just going to ask, in that model, yes. you, you, you told, and everybody should take a look at that scale model in Lawrence, but was there an observatory that was envisioned for yeah. the location of PLC in that model? Is that? Well, what was supposed to be here was the science building. Okay. And it's actually the science building that ended up as Pacific Hall. Yeah. Pretty much the same building was moved from here because they, were, they knew the sciences would expand and that we didn't own land that direction, but we owned the land that direction. So said, so, well, let's put a big science building over there rather than here, because if we put it here, we'll be hemmed in. That's a pretty good call. So yeah, it was in the end, it was a pretty good call. They forgot to put the bricks on the outside they, of the building. They, there was a cost reduction, and there were no brick put on that building because they couldn't afford them. That building was supposed to look it's supposed to be brick. like the old part of the EMU. So we're going to go around that side of the library and to the education courtyard, I think. Yeah. yeah. This building was built for the administration and the offices and, and uh, the teacher, you know, the administration part. Then in 1979, five. Se five, five, 75. When it was finished or started? Um, trying to get to this one. 77. 77. So the College of Education was ready to expand. Um, the university had 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 its fill of buildings as objects and decided to try something different. And this was the first building that was built as part of that new idea. And the new idea had to do with empowering the end users in decisions about how the buildings would be built. So the faculty and the College of Education met with the architects and they together they worked out what they wanted to do. And one of the things the College of Ed wanted was a courtyard. They wanted an enclosed sense of, of where they were. And so this building was built across there to make this courtyard. The arcades were added around, including that one as part of that project, and this outside stair. All of this has been uh, spiffed up in the, in the recent College of Ed project, which was completed this summer, yes. right? sort of in June, and we're going to go look at that building next. But The other so thing that happened in the 1977 project is two large classrooms that instead of having fixed seats and being all lined up to face the front, had movable chairs in their square rooms so you could orient them any way you want. That was a pretty radical idea in 1977. Still a little bit of a radical idea, but we see it a lot more. Any of you from Portland? Yep. So do you know Pioneer Courthouse Square? Will Martin was the architect of that, and he was the architect of this. And a graduate of the University of Oregon. And a graduate of the University of Oregon. Is that why he used a lot of brick? Oh, hmm. maybe. I had never thought of that. This came after that, didn't it? This Is came it after one? Pioneer Square. Uh, Pioneer Square. No, it was before it. Was it? Yep. Okay. Well, maybe we got him started knows? on brick. Maybe, maybe. maybe. we should have gotten a cut. <laughs> yeah. Questions? Other questions? Okay, let's go to the next stop. <laughs> this really marks the beginning of the Southwest Campus, or what we call the Southwest Campus. Uh, education's one end of that. When we began planning this, the project that resulted in in this building. The College of Education really had the goal of bringing themselves together on a campus because what they had were buildings that were arranged around parking lots, which they didn't really think was like the rest of the campus. So they said, isn't there some way we can, this was, these were all parking lots, everything you can see was a parking lot. And their other building, which you can't really see, is right over there, the Clinical Services Building. Just on the other side of Head Cove. So this building was put in the middle as a way to connect the two buildings but also as a way to form a new outdoor space in the, in the idea, along the idea that Ellis Lawrence had for creating the quadrangles on the rest of campus. Uh, it, it, it's College of Education. There are fabulous classrooms inside. There are 200 parking spaces underneath it. So it's our first uh, structured parking. And up to the left here is the School of Music. So the School of Music has become part of campus as well. 
And it also had a new addition done about the same time. Just sort of can't really see it. When we walk, we're going to walk back across the marching band field towards the student union where you can see it from there. Um, this, this little red building right here is called the Little Red Schoolhouse. It's part of the College of Education. This is actually the third place it's been on campus. It began life as the sales office for the Ellis Lawrence campus, the 1920s, 30s, 40s campus. And it was put between the Pioneer Mother and Johnson Hall. So it was out in that grass spot there. And when you came to donate money to the university, you came to this building, you looked at the model that Fred was talking about that's now in Lawrence Hall, and you got your checkbook out and you wrote a check. Because you wanted to build Girlinger Hall or Hendricks Hall or any of those halls that were back built in that era. It then, it then became um, the theater offices when the theater was in Johnson Hall, and it was the costume shop for a while. And I heard this story about a month ago. I told you that Fred and I grew up on campus. My parents are both faculty members. My mother met my father in that corner office. <laughs> she was a sophomore, and he had come back from the war, and there he was. And the building, of course, was over there by Johnson Hall. <laughs> it wasn't here. So uh, interesting story. It is an Ellis Lawrence building. It's an original building. It used to be over here, and they picked it up from yeah. there and moved it over there. Right where this building is. Right. And when they built that, they just moved it a little bit farther. And when we were planning all this, we didn't want to move it a fourth time. So we left it there. <laughs> so again, hopefully you can see some of the aspects of what we call the neo-traditional campus, where we're trying to bring back buildings that make outdoor rooms, make open space, that, that create actively uh, engaging spaces where people who happen to meet can have conversations. Two little factoids about this. The College of Education wanted a landmark that you could see from Alder so they could have a front door. So when they said come to the front door, people knew where the front door was without having to ask. <clears throat> Their old landmark is back behind us here. And, and it was, uh, if you were a faculty member and you wanted to tell your spouse where to pick you up, you would say, honey, meet me at the Statue of the Naked Lady. And that's what they used to call that, that's what they still call it. <clears throat> so your car, your husband or wife would be out here in the car and you'd come out and they'd be right by the Naked Lady. The other thing that's a little different about what we're calling the neo-traditional campus is that the buildings don't try to look completely different from everything that came before them. So you can look at the 1970s building, and it is reminiscent of the older 1920s buildings. And the one we just finished is still in that same family. And they all look different. It's not like they have to be exactly the same. They can have their own character, but they're in the same family. They're related. And we'll see that. Let's go out to the middle of the marching band field, and you can see the new coast. So we're actually, we're now, <laughs> We're into uncharted territory. Yeah, we're so off. yeah, I understand you're going to the student union, so we're going to walk that way with you, we're off the right? Script. <laughs> and uh, so this was built as the uh, marching band field, so the marching band could practice. And the marching band now practices either. Is anybody on the marching band? Anybody in the marching band? They either practice at the Mashovsky Center, or one of the turf fields by Hayward. Turf fields by Hayward, but not here so much anymore. Sometimes the percussions out here. Um, it's, it's used for uh, ultimate frisbee, the summer camps use it. And somebody here said, well, it's a parking lot. I thought, well, it was a parking lot for the last two years, <laughs> but for the 18 years before that, it was a marching band field. We built the field when the library was expanded. This is the back of the Knight Library. So it's got some of the same ideas. It's got you know two ends and a middle. It's got top and a bottom. So again, neo. Before that too. Neo, and it was a field before that. It was a construction <laughs> stage. Used to go through. Yeah. So that's what part of the additions in school music. That building. Again, what Fred was saying about making buildings that look like they're a part of the campus, but are but are new. Trying to do both. Using brick. Using brick in patterns. Using windows that are uh, are not just big blank windows, but are broken into sections. So all of these things add to the texture of the campus and make the buildings look like they're at least cousins, if not brothers and sisters. Because we are a campus, and when we get done, we really want it, everything to work together as a campus. Student Union. Student Union. Okay. Mm.
So this is the bonus extra segment. <laughs> this, this is where it gets to be fun. When the EMU was first built, it was just, you know, this part, the old part. It was just a lawn from the front entrance there to the fishbowl all the way down to 13. So this was all one lawn that went out to the Bow Streets University in 13. And uh, was it when they built it or after they built the free speech platform? Do you know? No, I think it was here. I think that, that well, brick. It was here, yeah. But I think they built it as part of this. As part of the construction. Yeah. But there was something called the free speech platform, a little podium. It was right here overlooking the lawn. And right at the end of that. And anybody, yeah, that, see that little brick wall? It goes right at the, the end, end of that, that brick, brick wall. wall. If you look at the brick thing that's down there on the stage, and imagine it right at the end of the wall. That's right where, where that trash can is. There's this thing called the free speech platform, and anybody could come up as long as they didn't get violent. Or yell fire. Or yell, well, I don't, outside, you can yell fire. <laughs> yeah, you could yell fire. Um, and there was a lot of speech, a lot of free speech over the years. In, uh, in the mid 70s, early 70s, they designed and built the addition to the EMU that's on the back side, the Ben Linder room and the uh, thing with the big skylight and the craft center and all that stuff. And there was a child care center there. And in doing so, uh, I was in school at the time, the student government insisted that they create a pedestrian connection underneath. Because it used to be you had to walk up and through the EMU to get from all the classrooms back to all the residence halls. And that was just so inconvenient. So they created the connection underneath. And in doing so, they made it so the free speech platform and a big lawn was instead the free speech platform talking to nothing. And a funny little stair, that, what do we call it, the waterfall stair? Waterfall stair. Because it became a waterfall when it rained. It, none of the steps were even, and it was, it was a good way to break your neck. And then a series of very small courtyards, because this is right after all the demonstrations of the early 70s and late 60s, they didn't want too many people to congregate. So they built it so that no more than about 20 people at a time could congregate. And that's the way it was until, well, we were working on campus. The students came to the planning office and said, hey, we need to fix this problem, this free speech platform that doesn't work. It doesn't speak to anybody. And they and landscape architecture students started a process that resulted in the amphitheater. So the students closed 13th. The students built the amphitheater, put the free speech platform back in a place that actually speaks to somebody. So that's the story of the free speech platform. <laughs> Um, the, the building itself was one of Lawrence's last designs. It's a mixture of modern and traditional ideas and materials. Uh, the the fishbowl is the site of the food fight from Animal House. But of course, there aren't food fights anymore. Um, <laughs> but as students, we could stand outside and, and we watched inside as they, as they filmed it. Um, I think that's about the end of our tour. Thanks for uh, thanks for being such a great audience. That's such a dumb thing to say. Any last questions? But, uh, yeah, last there are any last question? questions. Could you talk about like how many people go through here between like eleven and one ish? Pretty Can much everybody. Yeah. Well, like I think one of you gave me a number a while ago when we did a disability tour. Uh huh. And like it was a crazy big number. It's a crazy big number, but and I don't know what the like number a, is. Yeah, thirty within a thirty minute time frame. Crazy way again. More than a thousand, probably. Yeah. 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 It's huge. It's huge. Well, it's been fun. Thanks, Chris, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. You made it without the rain. Yeah.